Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the first after lunch session. I hope that if you are hangry, you now feel better. Um, I know that was the case for me. Um, so yeah, if everyone can just kind of take their seats, don't feel afraid to sit toward the front to give Chris a little bit more of an audience. Um, so Chris Blazier, he's the Senior Director of Innovation at Elastic, and he's giving a great talk today um, about why sometimes going custom makes sense and how you can really leverage custom builds to increase innovation at your organization. So if you all will give a warm welcome to Chris, he's going to take the stage and take you on an innovation journey. Thank you. Testing, can you hear me? Perfect. All right, let's get started. So. Um, a little intro about me, uh, like she said, Chris Blazier, D Director of Innovation at Elastic. And so uh, I just want everybody to know here, I'm just like each of you. I was either a system admin, I was a developer for a little while, I ran a, a small shop at one point, and when I got hired, I got hired to lead a business systems team. We had CRM, we had finance apps, we had integrations and help desk. And then from there, we started up our PMO group, like you would imagine, as we started to grow. Data analytics, we started bringing in some of those capabilities, and an IT compliance group. I held that role through our IPO, which is a big milestone for um, software companies, and so a lot of celebrations there. And then I switched over to an engineering-focused role within the support group, where we were building support automations. And we eventually moved that to a scalable solution. And then that solution is a lot of what we're going to talk about today when we're talking about building. And that's what formed earlier this year. We transitioned. The entire group moved. And now we're an independent entity as an innovation group, where we're building tools for what we call our customer success group, which is support, consulting, CSMs, um, and training. So that's a little bit about me and kind of the journey that we're going to talk about today. And so uh, I was helping my daughter with her homework, 10-year-old daughter, and we were learning about explorers. And uh, she was learning about Sir Francis Drake, how he circumnavigated the world to discover uh, an increased geography, learning more about the oceans and charting it. And it was like a, a parallel to what I was trying to say in this presentation. It's like, in IT, what I see a lot now is that we're focused on budgets, we're focused on project management, but we need more explorers. And that's what this talk's gonna be about. Being an explorer, willing to voyage into new worlds, building new things that are novel and better than the people that were before us. So today, I'm gonna walk you kind of through my journey, my voyage on the team. There's gonna be some victories along the way. Yay, we launched a new application. There's some, gonna be some defeats where it's like, it doesn't work the way we thought it was going to work and people telling us over and over again. And then um, maybe I can convince you over this 40 minutes together that there are some things worth the cost and frankly the risk of failure to become the business partner that all of our companies really need. And so I think it's a missed opportunity if I don't call this a fantastic voyage. Uh, RIP to Coolio and anybody that remembers Dangerous Minds, one of my favorite movies going up. And so in this voyage, we're going to start even before I joined Elastic. And so they had just moved to a new support system. Uh, we're going to call it Salsa Fork Service Cloud. Names have been changed to protect the innocent. And so on this platform, um, they said, OK, you're going to have case management. You're going to have milestones. You're going to have entitlements. And what that basically means is if a customer pays more, they get a little faster response from support. So the system's going to do all that for you. We also know that it's a general platform for automation that's going to help us be more. And you know, everyone's probably heard this speech, right? It's fully customizable, fully in quotes here, uh, for branding, functionality, integrated management, all the stuff that we talked about. And so that's how it was right before I joined. So six months later, the VP of support wrote a letter. Um, for this, I'm going to call it a manifesto, is really what it was. And it was, he simply said, the system that we just spent months, years trying to get ready for, uh, it's not suited for our technical use case and support. And that it limits us. In our, all the plans that we want to do in the future, this will be the limiting factor. And he said, in his eyes, we need to build our own solution. And so I, I'm taking that in. I'm, I'm kind of new on the team. This was my second week, oh, a week in the company that I got this. And I broke it down into two groups of issues that he was pointing out during this conversation. And it's one of them is this uh, SSO single sign-on. We didn't have this like uh, single identity for all of our users. And what it did is it created a fragmented experience. You probably, a lot of you probably realize this. When they go into support, there's one username and password. When they go to training, there's another one and, and so forth. So that was a, a very bad experience for our customers. And we wanted to get better at that. Um, the other bullet point there around file uploads, this experience that they had to have with us, it was just lacking some of the things that we wanted um, to refine. 
And then finally, our branding was not consistent across those. So within this group, I thought these were things that we could solve. If we put enough effort in and we started looking at the requirements, we could do these on the current platform. But then there was these core platform issues that I just couldn't fix. And so these platform issues, uh, it starts with the markdown. If you're not familiar with markdown, it's just a, a form of typing that allows you to format it back and forth. And it's very technical language popularized by GitHub. Uh, if you use that. And so that's how our support engineers and our customers, they interact with each other. There was no support for that. It was not an option. Uh, another one, there was no autosave. So imagine working a response to a customer for half an hour, 45 minutes. You go get a cup of coffee, you come back, and the browser froze. You lost all that work. And it was happening enough that it was a problem to our users. And so uh, the other thing was there was no asynchronous updates. So when you think about text messaging back and forth today, you get a, a, a text, a second text, you start responding, you get another text. You change your mind what you wanted to say because that next text is funnier because of what they just said. And so when you go through that, that, the system doesn't allow for that. You have to refresh it. So this is just modern applications that they were not meeting our demands. And so as we talk about this voyage, we have victories and defeats. This is the first time we're going to talk about this victory where the VP of support was really demanding us to be better. And he looked at us and said, how can you be better? And we started having those conversations that we hadn't had before. And so uh, I think about it this way. I'm a new director on the team. I'm kind of freaking out. <laughs> like we have this, uh, this SaaS first world where we think about this good, better, best model, best of breed we talk about. And, and so this, there's a Harvard Business Review article on the good, better, best approach to pricing. I have a link there. It's a great one to read. And it talks about the, the mental side of it and also like the offensive and defensive positioning of pricing. And it's a very interesting read because as a consumer of this, this is what I think about. You know, if you're already at the best solution with a t uh, top tier vendor, like what's next? Like where do you go to when you start getting pressed for these? And so you think to yourself, what's, what's better? What's that next lane? What's better than best? Well, is there the bestest out there? There's no lane for that. And so what we did was we started talking to the vendor and we said, here's some of the problems that we're hearing. And we engaged with them. We engaged with their product management team. And we said, hey, when are you going to solve this? And we just realized that we weren't on the same page. Like our use case, while their platform's really good, our use case was different. And so what we said in uh, later that year, December 2017, we decided to build the bestest. I like to make up words, so we're just going to call it that. And so in December 2017, we made this project. We called it Dream Machine. That was it. It was an aspirational project. And so we had, this, we had to start thinking about principles about how do we want to build it. So our first principle was make it dumb. Don't over-engineer it. When you start going down this custom path, you can get into rabbit holes really easy. So this is what we did. And we define what we are going to do. We're going to build a purpose-built support tool for Elastic, their customers, and our engineers. Because like the VP said, our customers deserve it, our employees deserve it. We were going to launch it replicating existing functionality. It's just that, that simple. Let's just look at what's done today, what was working, then tweak it as we need to. Um, initial re release, when you, I said you could go customers or employees, we decided to help the customer first. Customer-centric business, that's what we did. When we started talking to people that we were going to build this, suddenly we had to start saying what we're not doing. In other words, we aren't going to build a solution to sell to our customers later. We're, we're not Zendesk. We're not some of these other companies out there. And so we need to be very clear there. The other thing is, is that we're not replicating the CRM system that we already have. We want to rely on that as the system of record, right? We don't want to create another CRM system that's not our competitive advantage. So this is what we stated. And so the defeat that we're going to mention here is don't call your project Dream Machine. Because what ends up happening when you name something like that, it can do anything. It's so aspirational. People would be like, is this going to close deals faster? Is it going to help me with my renewals? Is this going to make lunch? And we said, no, it's not. It's a support portal at first. We can help some things later on. We're going to influence re renewals. But at its core, it's a support portal. And so the first thing you start doing, you start thinking about the staff that we need. And uh, I don't know about you, but if somebody has a project, I suddenly don't have 10 new hires to hire. Like, I don't get that. So we started thinking strategically, how are we going to hire for this? And so the first thing we knew, we needed a product, product manager. And so this product manager was going to be responsible for end-to-end -end product management, uh, understanding what the pain points are, uh, building out sprints, milestones, and then ultimately launch plans. And so we uh, talked around. We started advertising this to people within the team, and we identified somebody that was interested in doing this. They were a team lead for CRM, and they were a high performer who had never done this before. Right? So you're putting this kind of faith. But we had faith in them, and we were going to support him and provide everything that he could to be successful. 
Then we knew we needed at least two engineers, one to focus on the back end, uh, the API development, and the other one to uh, focus on user experience, user design, and on the front end. And so we had these staggered a year apart from each other, and the back end started helping on other enhancements. We couldn't just dedicate to this project. We had to build other things at the same time. So we were constantly picking a, a little bit of prerequisite work while also delivering new functionality for other groups. Then what we did is we said, okay, if we're gonna build it for support, let's get a little bit of help from support. So we identified a, team, a tech lead over there that was gonna give us half of his time and help kind of give some oversight and make sure that we were building what support was looking for. Then we did a very similar thing on the CRM side. We identified somebody with strong IP, uh, API skills on that side, and they were interested in helping. And so we kind of negotiated and said, okay, half the time they can help us. We didn't always use half the time, but we knew that there was some earmarked time if we needed help. So that was the staff that we built with. They built most of the tool. We get, had some people add later on to the team, but this was the core team that built 80, 90% of the system. And so what's, now that you've got your project manager, the first thing we did is said, okay, let's send out a customer survey. And so what we got was from this customer survey is really some interesting insights. We identified four places that customers said, hey, uh, this is a, a problem. And uh, first one was a general user experience. So as you started using our portal, you started interacting with us, they were kind of confused where the navigation was. So that was one point we needed to get a little bit better around that experience. Like was mentioned by on the manifesto, attachments ended up being a real problem. People didn't know where they went. They had to open a case first and then attach it. There were some fundamental problems with that process. We knew that the experience when you're looking at a case and you start interacting with this uh, customer support engineer, then you were gonna have some problems as you navigate through that thread. That was also a consistent theme. And then the editor, like we said, this conversation about markdown and understanding how to format things so that we know what we're talking about. Those are kind of the four big points you see highlighted here. And so the victory that we talk about is like, this sounds like product management 101, but think about it, if you've never done it before and you are taking it on the first time, doing this was so valuable because we found later on in the conversations was that they said, why are you building this? It was like, our customers demanded it. We could go back to this and say, this was the number one item people asked for. This is why we're focusing on these things. And so a lot of that came back from this exact information that we gathered. So uh, how many people in this group deal with requirements gathering on a regular basis? Uh, thank you for your service. It's a hard job. And so uh, this slide's for you. I don't think you can have a business systems presentation without a requirement slide. It's just a requirement. And so we go through, uh, remember the principles I talked about at the beginning. Uh, make it dumb, don't over-engineer it. So that's what we started from. And our MVP will replace the existing functionality. So then we start going through it, all right, what does that mean? We created an inventory of what the portal does. What you see on the left-hand side is actually the first wireframes we built. We just started marking them up on a screen and that was really low-fi, but we knew, we kind of figured out what did we have to build. From there, we adjusted based on the experience that we got through the um, survey with customers, and we tweaked a couple things here and there, and we started listening to our users internally, our support engineers, and we ref refined all those wireframes, we built the milestones, and then we just went at it. You know, there was nobody saying, uh, do it this way, do it that way. We just kept iterating on it as we started making progress. And so anybody that's dealt with system requirements know that scope creep is real. As soon as you start asking questions, they're like, well, can it also do this? But, uh, but what about this piece? What was really advantageous to us is that we made these points and these principles and we limited it to known pages. So I could say, does the system do it today? Well, it's not gonna do it when we launch, but we can add it to that famous backlog, right? <laughs> so we add it to the backlog and we know that we can groom these and add them to the roadmap as we start thinking about what's next. And so that was a big victory for us that I'll continue to remember as I go down other builds. So how many people are technical developers in here like SuiteScript, NetSuite, Apex, Dutton, and any of that kind of development? This is your slide. Uh, I figure you have to also have a technical side. Kind of feel like Oprah, you get a slide, you get a slide. But uh, this is the last one, I swear. Um, and so the purpose-built experience that we have here, it's all built on a Kubernetes backend. Uh, we have a modern responsive interface. We use a React front end, a Node TypeScript backend. And what that does is we have real product developers on our team, right? You don't see uh, another system in there. And we'll, we'll, get about, we'll get into kind of the API stuff. But we know now that not only is it a modern interface, but we're also now a shared navigation. So in our product in cloud, you click a button, you come right over to our system without an additional interaction. That's what Okta is there for, and that's our single sign-on integration. And it's been a big win for us on our side. 
We also support large files now because we have this API layer in this three-tier architecture that we have here that we can talk to an external service, host much larger files than we ever could on a, the platform before. Uh, once again, Service Cloud has become our single source of truth. You don't see another database on here that says customer data, because there is none. We're talking directly to Service Cloud. You see there is a storage session for um, sessions for logins and things like that, so we kind of have to do that. But other than that, we don't store customer data. So I think it's really important here that I mentioned, kind of as you go down a build process like this, you have a competitive advantage somewhere. So our product, Elastic, if you're not familiar with it, it's a search company. So our competitive advantage is our product itself. And so it's a great use case when you think about a support portal where you have to search cases, you have to search articles, you have to do these things. We actually have a product that it plays in that space. It's very helpful. And so the thing that you don't think about when you go down this build path and the victory I wanna point out is this product feedback loop we're starting to get now. So we talk to our engineering team more and we're saying, hey, we're building this. What, what's your designs on this? Just uh, uh, two weeks ago, we identified a bug in one of the products we were using. We opened up an issue they resolved it before the customer saw it. Like imagine that kind of value being driven back to your engineering team, and that's what we have because we started down this build process rather than a buy a SaaS application. And so if we step back and see what's the overall approval timeline, I think you've talked, I've said a lot of things that we did, but how long did it take us? And so uh, going back to the manifesto in January 2017 that the VP of support wrote, I'm kind of I'm calling that implied approval, approval. When you write something like that, that means like, let's make a change. And so th then it took us about a year to get to this idea that IT is going to go down this path. And during that year, we talked with the vendor. I have mentioned this before, but we really had a lot of conversations and said, hey, product management, where do we fit on your roadmap? Where does technical support fit on your support portal roadmap? And we talked to the account executive teams. We even went to a couple other vendors just to make sure that we did our due diligence. And we found that the, our use case is not their focus. I think that's where the, 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 the line is drawn, right? If they're not truly in your same use case, should we buy them as a software? Should we make it work? And that's when we decided to build it. So in uh, April of 2019, we said, okay, now how do we get everybody else on board? How do we get the executives on board? How do we get our CEO on board? And so what we did is we went to our product team. Remember, we've never done this with a product manager that's never done it. And we said, product team, how do you do this? And they said, hey, we have a technical review board and we meet and so show us your slide, show us your architecture. So we prepped and it was a little scary for us. We'd never done it before, but we did it. And we said, here's our architecture de designs. Here's our user flows. This is what we're working on. The CEO is there poking holes in our arguments, right? It was a little nerve wracking, but we got through it. Ultimately got approval all the way from the top down. And then that puts July 2021 as the go live date for this support portal that we're talking about. And so I call it a victory and defeat in this journey because four and a half years, like that's a long time. And so ultimately what we did is we, we look at this as a defeat Four and a half years, yeah. We only really had about less than two years of development that went into it, and we had all the other work I talked about. And we could have sped that up if we leaned into it harder, if we got early approval. Like, that's a different way we could do it. We could do it. But ultimately, victory, because we actually did it. So many people fail when they go down this path. Even the vendor themselves, they, <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to name names, but they said, you probably uh, can't do this, one, so it gave us a little bit of energy to go do it. And you probably shouldn't. We have hundreds of developers doing, working on this. But once again, since their use case was different than ours, we felt a need that we should go down and build it. So that was our timeline, four and a half years, take it for what it is. And so I talked a lot about requirements, I talked a lot about the process, but what does it actually look like? Like, what did we build? And so this right here is a screenshot, yeah, you can kind of see it, of the previous portal that we had. This was on a community, it was slightly close to our colors. Uh, we had uh, the, the frame, the layout was only so customizable based on the way that we were gonna do it. And so this is what you used to see as a customer. After we launch, this is what you see. And so this interface is actually built with all the same UI components that our own product uses. And so that seamless UI and branding was built into the libraries we were using. And suddenly they, everyone was like, this makes a lot of sense. I mentioned the attachments being a problem. You see, we have an attachment thing right in the middle of the screen, knowing that our customers had that as one of their biggest issues. So we worked on that user interflow. And we also have markdown support. You heard me say that enough now. So we did those type of things that we knew our customers needed. But you could say, well, Chris, why did you build it? It looks just like the old one. And the reason we built it is because of what's coming now. 
These are all the things that, this is what an interface looks like in our current wireframes for our engineer views to start to consume it. So we think about automating knowledge understanding and, under, and which way they, they should start looking at these knowledge-based articles based on the terms of this case, things like that. We can build into our, our platform because we own the entire stack. And so I'll talk about some of the other tools that we're building here shortly. But you also see search down at the bottom being one of the main uses, and not only searching in the thread of this, but also what about searching the process that's going through. Like when we hand it off to another team, we should be able to search in the thread and say, when did it happen? Who did it go to during this time? And all that's possible because we've redesigned the user interface using the same data that's in their system. So on the day that we launched, we had instant wins. And that's what we'll talk about here. Uh, the first day we launched, we were five times faster than the previous application. Five times. So when a customer went from one page to another to another, that's what they were experiencing, this improvement in speed. We were able to have 10 times larger files uploaded because of this. Now, and it, it could have been larger, but we capped it because we said nobody needs to go larger than that, but that's essentially what we were able to do. We had... Uh, support instantly for dark mode, which is kind of fun for people that work in one versus the other on a regular basis. Um, and then we also had support for I-18N. If you don't know what that is, internationalization. I love it because they don't like spelling internationalization. I don't spell well, so I like the I-18N. And uh, now, so if somebody was to write a French article and they have French as their uh, default language, we can automatically serve them up internationalized uh, content. And so that's a road we're going down. We're also integrated, like I said, with our, our cloud solution, and it's seamless for the users. So relevance is now powered by our own search for cases and search and articles. And also from a user's perspective, there was no loss in functionality. So we gave them a brand new portal, and it, I, never once did I hear, oh, this portal doesn't work for us. They had all the same functionality, and it was a seamless transition. So the, the way that I categorize these aren't by mistake. When you go to our product, our product has these corporate values about speed, scale, and relevance. Once again, I said we're a search company. So what we did on our side, when we started going to a roadshow and saying, hey, look at what we did for our customers, we translated what we did into what our product teams, into what our management team knows. So we said it's faster, we can scale more, and it's more relevant for our customers. That was a, a hit in the communication with each of them, and they were able to resonate more with this, the wins that we were doing. And so let's fast forward now 16 months to about today, and I want to share with you two new systems that we're working on. One of them, we have these automated product diagnostics. Essentially what it is, it's a framework that we built that people can contribute alerts to that allow you to identify problems with the system. Either uh, something's actually wrong with the system, or maybe there's a best practice not being followed, or there's an informational warning that you want to send somebody. So we can automate kind of these known issues. You can kind of think of it like a, uh, an old antivirus where you had to upload your virus definitions. And if you were uploaded, if you had the latest definitions, it would tell you. That's kind of what we built here. And we're automating these known issues. And this has been a, a good win for us so far, and we're just kind of getting started here. Another system that we have is uh, the knowledge base. So I mentioned before that we had an integrated knowledge base solution with the previous vendor, and we started thinking about it, well, what value does this provide us? So I think we could have stayed on that knowledge solution, but ultimately it kind of lost favor within the group. It was harder to integrate with. There were some issues that we had there. And so we looked at it, and we went back out to market, and we said, what knowledge solutions are out there? What we saw was nobody was adding a ton, and I apologize to anybody that's a knowledge-based vendor out here, I don't know if you are, but there was nobody truly adding value past what our competitive advantage was already in full text-based search, right, what we talked about earlier. And so we made another decision, and we were like, well, you know what, what we should do is, if we're gonna do this, let's build it again. So this was another build versus buy decision. And because of our advantage, we went down this build path. And so we know how to tune relevancy for search. And we're starting now working with our marketing teams, building up blogs and documentations of how you could do this for your own company. And those are the things that, once again, you don't think about in the build versus buy, but now those conversations are happening on a regular basis for me of how we integrate together. Building products and going down this path is not all rosy. There are some real defeats along the way. So what we had to do, we built knowledge base one time and we had a certain use case. Then when we transitioned to this innovation team, suddenly we have more teams asking for it. We had to completely re-architect our backend because it was a now a new solution. We probably lost four months there. 
But the thing when you go down build, when you build products, it's an iteration, right? You learn something new the next time. And so like, we took it on the chin and we said, all right, let's do it better this time. And now we're able to create new relationships in our databases that we couldn't before. And that's where we're at right now is this, this changing of the architecture on the back end. And so I think alone, the, the tools that I just mentioned, there aren't, they're not innovative alone. Maybe the, the diagnostic thing is a little innovative, but they don't really scream, oh, that's amazing. Uh, but ultimately, when you start to put them together, that's what we talk about in our uh, technology as a competitive advantage. So I'll give you an example here. So our consulting team uh, wanted to use our diagnostic tool to start help in identifying customers that were good for migrations to the cloud. We have an on-prem and a cloud version. And so what they would have to do is they'd have to go into a customer's uh, information, kind of download something, they'd have to look at it, they'd write a report and so forth. What we did was we built that report into the alerts and ran it for all their customers. And this is that quote that we get. They estimated we saved them 3,000 hours in that project by automating that process. Like, just awesome. There's nothing else that you can say. That's exactly, it was pretty amazing to hear the impact that we had when we weren't even thinking about that group when we built this. And that, and that was a, an eye-opening thing for us. Another one, when we talk about putting these together as our, our advantage, we're thinking about right now, how do we make the alerts that we built customer-facing? Maybe within the support portal, we can say, okay, go in there, you click a button and say, hey, why don't you review my product, give me recommendations. We can show them recommendations and then pass them the knowledge base articles so they can start to see self-service, right? Starting to get them to consume more, start to use it more and understand our products. And then the last example I have is when you start going into the support portal and you want to start to search for something, you're searching for a particular product or maybe an error code, like we start to see that now in our products. And what we can do is we can start to recommend our knowledge base articles. We can start to use machine learning. We can start using AI. People are talking about this, right? But you can't really get advantages of that until you have systems like this in place where you can capture and start to change user behaviors. So that's where we're at right now is saying, well, how do we start to use these insights and increase the customer experience that we have. And again, use our technology as a competitive advantage. So I have data today that no out-of-the-box provider will be able to give you, okay? Uh, because I built these systems. So within the, and when I say I, it is a team. I've done nothing. My team is everything to me. So I, can, uh, I wish they were here because I would introduce you to all of them. They're great. And so um, within the last 30 days, 60,000 sessions, kind of give you scope of what we're talking about. We've had about 60,000 sessions the last 30 days. Um, that equates to about 700,000 alerts of customers that we have insights into our customers' usage that we can tell them, hey, you should look into these things. I know without a shadow of a doubt that when knowledge is attached to a case, cases close faster. And that's a cost savings to our support organization. With that savings, they can either slow down hiring, maybe you've heard a little bit of that happening in the industry, or they can, instead of slowing down hiring, they can focus on higher revenue generating activities because we've freed them up in this space. I can tell you there's a positive correlation between usage of our platform and account growth and renewals and expansion. And so I actually know these numbers to the decimal. Uh, I can't share them with you, but we know we can measure those and we know we can start to make impacts in theirs and see if we're getting better or worse in these. So the, having this data has really started new discussions, new teamwork coming from new departments. And so even we're talking now with our product team, how can we use the data that we have for better customer experiences in our own product? I mean, that's new conversation for us, which great conversations to start having. We are being asked for our knowledge base tool to be used to help team enablement, adding their own content into there and start driving that same rich search behavior for all of our users. And then we have incoming requests that we haven't even thought about because people started interacting with our platform and started seeing what's possible. We had uh, one person had built a tool to compare version seven to eight, let's say, and then they would show milestone, like what were the big features that came out there? They built it on a spreadsheet and then they shared it with the group. And then what would happen is one person would be in the sheet changing a, a version and another one would jump in the sheet, try to change a version. And like they would be stepping on each other's toes and it was kind of a, a, a diminishing returns because it was starting to become popular. We, in a, a course of about two weeks, basically built that on our platform. And now everybody in the company can use that same tool to start to have conversation with their customers about the milestone differences between versions. And those are things that we didn't think about when we built it, but now that we have the ability to, we're doing that. 
So the victory here is about having that real data that shows financial impact. Maybe not just, not, just usage impact as well. It doesn't always have to be financial, but having that data to, uh, to talk to your executive management, to talk to your boss and say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how we're impacting either your bottom line or your top line. It's a, a gigantic win for us. So I, I think about this. In your next build versus buy decision, you start going through that. I think we all have the same thought process going back to that uh, good, better, best. And we think about what are the costs associated to it. So many of our executives are, are driving this way. And the costs are people cost on the build side. That's the foundational cost there. And you know, it's product management. Yes, we need to know that. Build times, we need to know all that. Um, and then it's also who's going to support it. On the SaaS side, we look at the base as a subscription cost. Now, this isn't all the decision-making points. I just try to make a point here. And so on the buy side, we have requirements fit. We have vendor lock-in. Also, who's going to do support? How, how important is support to you as a mission-critical product? And so that's kind of what we see. And a lot of times, just subscriptions win out at right? that SaaS world. But we should have other indicators in here pushing this in the other direction when appropriate. And so think about your brand. Do you want to be just like everybody else on the SaaS platforms, or do you want to be the best or the bestest, you know, the word I'm making up? The data insights that we had, do you want those data insights? Are you happy with the data insights that you have in your current platform? Maybe you can get a little bit better there, but ultimately you can't get to some of the data that I've already showed. The user experience, are you demanding more of your IT group? And do you, does your customers, do your employees, do they demand more? That's the user experience we're talking about. And then finally, like all of these pieces, they really add up to being a business partner. It's not just that we're IT buying applications and, and trying to control costs. It's about how do we build that business partnership. And so I think there's not enough IT as an acronyms out there. So let's do another one. IT as a business partner here. I'm going to maybe it'll catch on. And so most of my career, I've kind of heard this term, IT as a cost center, IT as a profit. I think many of you might have heard that as well. And I, I don't really like it. It's mostly an accounting topic. I understand it. Uh, but to say that IT is all a cost center or all a profit center is not very accurate. It really depends on the role that IT plays within the organization. It can even be different by different applications. In some applications, you just can't make profit from it, right? You can't be that efficient. You can't be more efficient. At some point, you're just going to be a cost. And so I think that's what we should think about, that in aggregate as IT groups, we should start thinking about how can we just start to make a profit, just start in aggregate, start having those conversations. So I love data, I love charts, so let's put those kind of in a data terms here. So you have a number of applications across the bottom, total costs on the left-hand side, and let's just say SaaS applications, they all cost the same. If you had none of us in the room, no IT, this is kind of, let's make it really easy, it's a baseline, and that's just what it would cost, pure SaaS play. So, but if you add in IT, and for better or worse, just a reactive IT where we're just taking tickets, trying to help out a little bit, maybe we do a little bit of cost optimization, you're still adding cost on top of it. There's no getting around it. That's just who we are, right? And so most of us try to be this business enabler, and we start to think about, uh, we manage system integrations, and we start to correlate that, and we talk about product management. Are we aligned with business units? You start to get, you see how it sh shapes and starts to head back towards that baseline that we had made. But it takes so many people. At some point, you get headcount problems. You're like, well, I need more business analysts to help out. And you start to run into those at scale and those problems. But as a strategic partner, seeing the shift of this and trying to change that overall curve in aggregate is where we want to be. That's where you talk about IT as a profit center. It's that difference between if you had no IT and driving aggregate costs down like this. That's the goal, and that's what strategic partners are. So let's go all the way back at the beginning. We talked about the good, better, best model. I love it. It's nice and simple to understand. And so let's say you're good. I mean, the people that have worked help desk out here in the crowd, right? It's not bad. You're good. You're cost conscious. You're reacting to issues. Uh, you, you have some compliance activities. That's kind of good IT. The other people in this group that are like system admins, say you're a NetSuite, Marketo admin, Salesforce admin out there, are you a business enabler? Are you reactive plus these other things? Like, have you started to understand and align with your department's goals? Have you started to make those, those changes? Do you have a little bit of development, some like scripting that's happening to, for automation purposes? 
And then finally, leaders here that are responsible for a stack, whether you're on the finance stack, go to market stack, whichever stack that is, are you aligned with your financial goals of the department? Like where have you created the competitive advantage for them and help really drive profit? That's the best, that's a stri to, uh, the strategic partner that our business is looking for us to be. So where do you fall in there? It's something that we all have to ask ourselves. The way I look at this too, it's, it's not a maturity model. It's not like you get to strategic partner because you've been doing it for five years, six years, seven years. You have to do different actions when you start heading towards the better and best model. And like, it took me 15 years to start to like scratch a, the surface of the strategic partner and show you some of the data that I have today. So I'm still learning a little bit more every day about it, but that's what I'm striving for. And so uh, as we summarize here, the, our journey together, this voyage, it, it, it's over, right? So in review, IT, business system, we need more explorers, in my opinion. We need more explorers willing to build in these situations. Obviously, where it's appropriate for your business, you can't build everything. But there are situations where you can start to drive a competitive advantage. Building products will have victories and defeats, and some of them will be terrible, some of them will be awesome. And that journey together is part of the exploration together. These build versus buy decisions, they should really include our user experiences, the impact that we're driving for them, and this ability to have strategic conversations. Like, if you're building it, it should enable you to have that conversation. If you're building and you can't because of it, then you probably built the wrong thing. I think that's what you need to start thinking about. Uh, I can't say it enough. The data, data, even earlier when we were talking about making sense of data, I think there's one going on right now. It's so key to have that and to become a, this, uh, a financial partner with all of our teams, understanding that, having the data that I explained today. And then kind of like the, going back to that manifesto, don't settle for good when you can be bestest. Like we have the ability to be better. We have smart people on our teams. Let's leverage those people to build great systems. And so for a little bit of continued reading, Mark Settle, who had uh, actually presented in one of these conferences previously, had a, a small article on LinkedIn, what's old is new again, build beats buy. It was, it was really great timing as I was writing this. And there was a quote in there, and it says, a compelling opportunity for IT to add value by returning to its roots. Imagine that. 20 years ago, before the IT revolution, or the SaaS revolution, this is all we did was build. So I spent 40 minutes talking about doing something that IT used to do every day. And the difference in the technology advantage was, was your IT shop able to build a better mousetrap than the next one? That's what it was, it was all about build. But now we're settling at a certain level for the SaaS applications that we have out there. So I'll leave you with this. If you're anything like me, a 10-year-old's homework is never easy, right? Sometimes you have to look up some more things. So uh, that ship right there, Sir Francis Drake, um, I actually didn't know this. He was also, yeah, he did the exploring and helped out. He was also a pirate that pillaged and murdered. He was a slaver, and he actually claimed California for England. So like, had things worked out a little bit differently, I would have had tea and biscuits instead of coffee and donut this morning. And uh, I learned something new during that time. And so hopefully you learned something new here today. And thank you very much. I, I don't, so we do have time for questions? Okay. So I, anybody have any questions? Are there things going on? I see a hand up. Thank you for not making it awkward. Got you. All right, uh, perfect. <laughs> Thanks so much. This is incredible. Um, what do you say to business users when they push back and say, yeah, this sounds great that IT wants to build and own this uh, and internally custom develop it, but when we have new features that we want and different priorities come up, all of a sudden we're SOL with a system that we either need to bring in external contractors, right, or yeah. like we're, bas you know, we're basically dead in the water. Uh, fun, boat pun. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well done. Yeah. Um, I think it goes back to the very first victory I had. So we had executive sponsorship, right? And so if you have it at the executive sponsorship, somebody at the table that's interpreting the data and bringing it back to the team and saying, this is what's driving value, then I think those conversations become a lot easier, right? Yeah, somebody's gonna have to maintain it and it's a commitment to have, but if that's what the executive team wants and then they wanna be better than their competition and things that you can start to drive, like we're having a lot of conversations around self-service, right? So if you want self-service, you need automated tools to do that. You need to be able to do things like we're showing in the knowledge base and things like that. So if the ex I'm saying, yes, you could have self-service, but 
you need to do it this way, or you, you have an option to do it this way, or you could do it this way, and we start having those conversations. And I think it's about educating and making sure that they have all the data to make the right decisions. I think some organizations just won't have the appetite for it, and that's okay. If you find the ability to, I say, go for it. Like, there's some opportunities, there's some real opportunities for real innovation. Thanks. Anyone else? That? Pascar, thank you. So Chris, as we are going down this particular path, um, it seems like you chose to get a product team, have engineers, et cetera, build it. Did you consider the new wave of low-code application platforms? Yes, no, why not? So they weren't as mature when we started, right? So that's what Mark's article is actually about, the low-code, no-code. So we, uh, we knew that some of those can't do the same things that we do architecturally on the back end. So we are able to leverage some of our internal engineering tools as well, like I mentioned, right? So our Kubernetes infrastructure, we can already do that because it exists within our, in our building. And so we're leveraging tools that are a known path for us that made it easier to build. The low code, no code actually doesn't exist in our environment, right? So there's actually more of a learning curve to go to that than go to a known path that we already could streamline builds for. I think in the future though, if you hadn't went down that path yet, I think that is a great opportunity for IT to start to put their toes in the water and saying, okay, what can we build? How can we integrate some of the, the um, more advanced technologies and customize for our team with the less risk? Like we had headcount at the end of the day, we have a, an entire platform we have to maintain, so we have risk that we've committed to. I think the low code is a much better way to start if you're not ready for that commitment. All right, fine. Thanks. Thanks for sharing this build versus buy. One of the questions always come up about other peripheral systems which you need to do for in the, your example of a support case management, like uh, having a telephony integration, having a chatbot, and all those things. So, how in your example, how did you address that? So, a great great example is we are working with a chatbot that we have on our website. And they said, <laughs> they said, well, oh, we, you're not on salsa fork, right? You, you can't uh, integrate. We don't have that out of the box. And I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, but do you have an API that we talk to? And they said, yeah, we have that. And so what we were able to do is when we start integrating those solutions, a lot of these uh, bots and a lot of them, they have a base API layer, right? And so we're able to interact more in more interesting ways with the bot because we control the API rather than an out of the box connector. So for instance, when a customer, this is what we're talking about today in, in our app, is when a customer starts uh, asking uh, questions of us, instead of using the bot to start to search a little bit of data that they have, we're passing the search through to us since we own a search engine. We can search everything on our side and provide them uh, any document that is either in our knowledge base or across our other systems and our other properties that we own. We pass it back through the chat app and the chat app becomes the vehicle for communication versus the uh, intelligent being that's trying to serve that information. And so like we're integrating other tools that way um, in the way that we want to, because once again, uh, the technology that we have versus how the vendor decided to do it. So it's been to our advantage so far. We'll see how it goes long term. Uh, right behind you. So where would you draw a line uh, when accepting to build? Uh, in your example, you were building a really nice UI layer on top of existing backend. Uh, if your customer said we need to build a whole new product for let's say recruiting because no SaaS application in market is good enough, would you take up that challenge uh, to build something that complex? Is that your competitive advantage? Like I go back to that idea, right? And if if you were in a market that was around this and you thought that you could, as IT, could provide a technical advantage because of building it, and there was appetite for that, and you could drive profit, and you can be a strategic partner with the business because of that, then I would consider it. But I think in that case, there's a lot of SaaS players out there. What's your profit driver? What's the strategic conversation? I think those uh, conversations are, are a little bit lower than what I would probably target to build because of that industry. So I think you go back to that same idea. Well, how is what we're building creating our advantage and, and moving forward our strategic conversation? Sounds like that's time. Thanks, everybody. 
Yeah, big thank you to Chris. That was such a great presentation. So we really just have a quick five-minute break. Um, coming up next on this stage, we'll have Mike Flynn. He's going to talk about how to enable a data-driven order-to-cash process. And I hear he got his kids involved in an experiment to make some kind of point, so that could be interesting to, to check in on. Um, and on the other stage in five minutes, we'll have a presentation on how adopting a product mindset can help um, enable your business technology team to really achieve digital transformation. So track one, track two, and we'll see you all in five minutes. <laughs> 